Hello. Ready for some fun? I always am. Let's watch, shall we? What is Link's favorite type of sandwich? A hero, of course. Earlier today, I wrote my sister, and I sent her a picture of this. Hold on a second. I sent her a picture of this. Yeah. This is a diagram, an outline of my notes that I've been taking for almost a week now. I've been wanting to get to this episode so badly, and I, I've been writing notes, and I've been getting inspired with all kinds of ideas, and I haven't been... Life gets in the way sometimes, doesn't it? We have best intentions of getting things done, and then life happens. Whether it be work or family, household chores, taking care of your kids, helping out your wife or your husband, helping a friend, having a family member help a friend so you can then take care of the kid, picking a kid up from school, dropping the kid off from school, picking him up again. Life happens and it rolls and it rolls and it rolls, and sometimes you can't catch your breath, can you? Sometimes it's just so much going on and the, little, the pet project you have, your hobby, the things that make you happy, seem to be put by the wayside. Not that I'm saying that's the situation here, but it kind of is. So I've been wanting to get to this. I've been wanting to talk to you guys about all these really cool things that are happening. And things keep happening. Just some brand new news today, and we're going to get right into that. So guys, thank you for being here. This is the Loud Boy Experience, and let's go. Uh -huh. summer of 74, I was working behind the parts counter for my dad at the farm equipment dealers, and this white Corvette pulled up. A white Corvette doesn't pull up in the farm equipment dealership that often. They came and asked if they could talk to Neil and take him out to lunch, and I could tell as Neil came back the rest of the afternoon that he was really troubled with something. He told me then that these guys were the managers of Rush, and they wanted Neil to come over and audition, and he said, I don't know what to do, Dad, and I said, well, Two things. First of all, we'll talk it over with your mother. But secondly, as far as I'm concerned, this is your passion. This is all you have wanted all your life. And I said, I guess there will always be a parts department here, so I think you've got to go for it. So I borrowed my mom's Pinto, <laughs> so perfect, and loaded my drums into that and drove up to Ajax. So the car pulls up with this kind of gangly guy with really kind of short hair. My first impression was that he it's kind of goofy. I remember thinking, God, he's not, he's not nearly cool enough to pee in this pant. I had Rogers with two 18-inch bass drums and everything set up really high and kind of weird looking. <laughs> and I was kind of weird looking. And then he started playing them and he pounded the crap out of those drums. <laughs> I was blown away. As soon as he started playing, he's playing these triplets, and he was so good. I think it's very common for musicians, especially in your early years, to feel that you totally blew it. <laughs> and I had that feeling, I could have played better, I should have played better, all that stuff. But um, um, they picked me. <laughs> Fifty years ago, Rush was born. It is R50. And to celebrate this, the Backstage Club has a bunch of really cool merchandise. Everything from t-shirts, and they have a black baseball, and they have what's called the R50 dad hat. I gotta get one. Also, glass mugs, and a coffee mug, and socks, a Motifs litho. I want that poster. The poster's really cool, actually. And it says, Established 1974. Lee, Lifeson, Peart. Go to the Backstage Club. Lots of really cool merch. Don't buy it all because I want some of it. Or at least I'm hoping my family might get me some for Christmas. I was also established in 1974. And in fact, I have right here 
the first American broadcast, 1974, in Cleveland, Ohio, on August 26, 1974. When they played the U.S. for the first time, that's the day I was born. And it blows my mind that the boys came down, played their first American show, at least their first American broadcast, recorded and put under this vinyl. That I, I love having this vinyl and because this is a celebration not only of Rush, but the fact that the day I was born, they were playing just a couple states away. And I find that really incredible, and it just means a lot to me. Of course, Rush began with this album called Rush. And back then, of course, we had Lee Lifeson and Rutsy. May you rest in peace. All the way fast forwarding to Clockwork Angels. 20 albums later, over 40 years of music. Clockwork Angels, a masterpiece of its own. And one could argue there's no better song than The Garden to be Rush's last track ever on their very last album. And The Garden is almost a, an autobiography of Peart, of what he wanted from life. It's about love and respect and family. And so it encapsulated so beautifully in the lyrics of Clockwork Angels and, of course, the book Clockwork Angels. I love The Garden for that reason. And I can hardly listen to it without crying, so I don't listen to The Garden that often. Of course, along the way, live albums. My, my wife recently got me this, All the World's a Stage. She found it in a record shop. This is original vinyl double album of All the World's a Stage. So many great live albums. Then finally, of course, you could argue my favorite song is Natural Science. Who could forget Permanent Waves? I've spoken to this before. The beautiful transition from their long multi-part songs into making modern music. And Natural Science served as this bridge. And such a beautiful song, such beautiful lyrics. It is does have three parts, but it's only told in like 11 minutes or so. Another great album that I love is this, having both parts, all of Cygnus X1 on one album. This was released for record day. I mean, check out the back here. I mean, how cool is that? Both hemispheres. <laughs> and there's a fly in there. There's a fly in the ointment. Yes, this is all of Cygnus X1 on vinyl. This is such a great thing. Of course, book one, The Voyage, and book two, Hemispheres. In the album that changed it all in its 50-year journey as we're celebrating R50, this is the album that changed everything for me. I was listening to pop music. I was lost in the doldrums of Top 40. And then I heard the opening notes in the cool mini Moog. Those space sounds. I remember the keyboards. Down. 21 Travel Course was the individual against the mass. And that album did communicate and reach people on a level that just blossomed outward by the classic form of word of mouth. Obviously, the opening 20 minute piece did not get played on the radio. 2112 changed everything for me, as I'm sure it did many of you. And, and who could forget the original three space wizards? themselves, the trinity of prog rock. We were never very good at the whole fashion image thing. Let's face it, we didn't have a clue. We desperately just wanted to wear jeans and t-shirts, but were raised in a period that said that's not okay. So we looked for some way of standing out in the crowd. I remember we were in San Francisco and we're staying in the Japanese part of town. So we found all these kind of kimonos and rows. We said, hey, why don't we try these? So that began the period of the absurdly prophetic robes. And I looked at the album cover and saw that there were only three of them, and they were wearing some funky clothes. <laughs> but I thought, how can three guys make such a sound? 2112 really bought us our independence. The record company has never been in on a single session that we've ever done. In fact, when we're done, it's all packaged, and they accept it the way it is. They have no choice. That somehow was the plateau of untouchable. Nobody thought they had the right anymore. So yeah, 2112 was absolutely the passepartout, you know, the skeleton key that opened that door that we could close behind us. Okay, from now on, ah, we do what we want. Happy birthday to Rush. Happy R50. 
I've been talking about this here and there on Twitter for about 10 years. I've made a little hashtag R50 as kind of a joke, but more of a hopeful statement. At the time, it was coming right off the heels of seeing R40. And I got to see R40 in Boston. I brought my wife and my dad this time. I had a feeling that it was such a momentous concert and tour celebrating these four decades with Rush and to see R40 and bringing my wife and bringing my dad, who was a recent Rush convert. It's funny, I went through all my life discovering Rush when I was about 14 years old. And you could do them. Oh, you can easy. You know, I'm 50 years old. All right, this is our 50. I was about to say you could do the math, but in 1988, or thereabouts, and I was about 14 years old, and I discovered Rush in 2112. And I was such a huge fan, and we were riding in the van one time. We had this big old minivan, the Ford Aerostar, you know, a, a basically a family mover, right? A utility van for a family. But we were blessed to have it. We didn't have a lot of money. And I'm sitting in the back with, I believe, my best friend Nathan next to me, taking a trip. And I put 2112 in probably the cassette. Yeah, it was probably my original 2112 cassette. Playing it through the stereo. When it got to the song, Temples of Searings, my dad, through the bombast rock and roll that is 2112, with all the road noise, kid noise going on in the van, he thought they were saying, we are the priests of the devil. We are the priests of the devil. I had to quickly... I was like the Flash, right? Right up front, opening up the cassette deck. And Dad, lyrics right here. Look, Dad, look away from the road for a second. Temple's a syrinx. It's like a sci-fi story. It's about fighting tyranny. It's about freedom. It's 2112. It's not devil worship. It amazes me to this day that he thought it said we are the priests of the devil. I just find that really funny. And I was so quick to make that correction. I wouldn't let that stand. But of course, later on, my dad discovered Rush. And he discovered Xanadu. But before that, La Via Strangiato. He still obsesses on YouTube over the live performances of La Via. He obsesses over it. He loves it. He knows every nuance of the song. And then he discovers Xanadu. And he just loves Xanadu. And he became this huge Rush fan. He, he watches more Rush on YouTube than I do. Which is so great. He was a recent Rush fan. And I had to bring him to R40. It was an amazing show. I am blessed beyond measure to get to see Lee Lifeson and Peart that one last time. Because as you know, we lost Neil. May the professor rest in peace. And I miss him. I've talked a lot about this. You know how much I miss Peart. And he would have been, I'd like to think, Neil would have been so proud of five decades celebrating our 50 as we are today. And man, I'm to a point where if Lee and Lifeson, right? If Alex and Getty went to Neil Peart or Mike Mangini, who recently left one of those two guys, one of the two Mikes from Dream Theater, if Lee and Lifeson, if Getty and Alex went to one of these two Mikes from Dream Theater and said, hey, Come tour with us. I'd be on board. Would you guys be on board? What do you guys think of that? One of the two mics from Dream Theater. Maybe after Dream Theater celebrates their 40th anniversary, maybe Portnoy could join Rush, complete the trio once again, and do an R50 tour. <laughs> I'm excited just thinking. What do you guys think? I know Peart can never be replaced. And Alex and Getty, through the years, have been very restrained to do anything like that. However, given that this is our 50, can you imagine? It doesn't have to be one of the two mics from Dream Theater. 
there are a handful, literally probably five, drummers in this world, you can think of them as I can, who could join Rush on stage and play those songs with perfection and honor Neil Peart and celebrate R50. What do you guys think? R50 tour. Get the guys back together. Bring on one of the best drummers in the world. I'm thinking Portnoy to join them. It would be phenomenal, wouldn't it? Let me know in your comments below. I'd love to hear from you guys. Happy birthday, Rush. Happy birthday to me. 1974. It was a very good year. I want to wish a very happy birthday to Ryan Reynolds. And most recently, I did a review of the If movie, Imaginary Friends. Check out my review and then go watch the movie with your kids. It's a phenomenal movie. And Ryan Reynolds is in Happy Birthday, Ryan Reynolds. Also, Amelia Clark, the mother of dragons, Daenerys Targaryen. It's her birthday today. Happy birthday, Amelia Clark. And finally, Sam Raimi, the director of the original Spider-Man 1, 2, and 3 with Tobey Maguire. Spider-Man 2 being one of the best superhero movies ever made. So Sam Raimi, happy birthday. Congratulations to Tom Holland. It appears that he will be in Spider-Man 4. It is in the works. Things are all greenlit and ready to go. And they're expected to start shooting sometime this coming next summer. I really enjoyed No Way Home. Andrew Garfield, Tobey Maguire, Tom Holland, three Peter Parkers, three Spider-Man all together. And in the end, they saved and sent back through to back to the original dimensions, multiple bad guys from multiple movies. It was a phenomenal movie. If they haven't seen No Way Home, do check it out. And there's a lot of rumors, and it may very well happen, that Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield will join Tom Holland for this. There's also speculation and talk that Tom Holland, he's kind of hinted that the Venom movies may be involved. He says the idea is crazy. Quote unquote, the idea is crazy. I think it's crazy, but he's very excited about it. So this could be a really, hopefully different. It'd be cool to go in a different direction and do something really awesome. Tom Holland has had a huge week. In an interview with Good Morning America, he talked about Spider-Man 4, hinted about all the things that I just mentioned, but also he dropped the news that he has been chosen is going to be in the next Christopher Nolan movie with Matt Damon. And that sounds really amazing. And he said that he's just as excited as if he was 10 years ago when he got the call to be Spider-Man. So now Tom Holland, Spider-Man 4 is coming, but also in the next Chris Nolan movie? Come on. I've loved Christopher Nolan's works. And of course, he directed three of the best superhero movies ever made, which is, of course, Batman Begins, Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises. You know what I noticed? Nobody panics when things go according to plan. Even if the plan is horrifying. Nobody panics. Because it's all part of the plan. Spider-Man 4, it is coming. It has been confirmed. They're going to start shooting. They're putting all the prep together. And my wish, I really hope, that Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield join them. To have all three Spider-Men together again. The interchange between them as Peter Parker was classic. And I'm a huge fan of Andrew Garfield. I really love Amazing Spider-Man. His first movie, the second one, not as much. But Andrew Garfield as Peter Parker was more kind of angsty. Even though he's much older than a teenager in real life. He played it so well that you believe and you buy into and you can empathize with what he's going through. And his scenes in No Way Home were, wow, in, in just a few words, they were heartbreaking. And you could see it in his face. But who really impressed me just as much was Tobey Maguire. To see Tobey Maguire now as the older kind of statesman giving some gravitas, and, and that's what he brought to it. And I love the little, little line like, all right, do you have a Spider-Man suit or are you just going as a, a hip youth minister? Such a great movie, No Way Home. And I'm really excited for Tom Holland. And I'm really hopeful that Andrew Garfield can join him again, along with Tobey Maguire, the three of them. And who knows, with some Venom in there, we could get some Tom Hardy as well.
<laughs> that would be super cool. So again, really excited. Congratulations, Tom Holland. Oh yeah, Mike, I was wondering that myself. Weird, isn't it? Oh, hey, Tom. How'd you get here so fast? Oh, he'll be along. I have his chicken puppet. Hey, where's Crow? <laughs> talking like what? Why are you talking like that? Well, no, I'm not. I'm just way ahead of you, Mike. Well, like that. You know, you're answering my questions before I ask them. I don't know. I'm just asking them the same thing. <laughs> no, you dope. I mean, I'm moving faster than you, temporally speaking. Hey, what do you mean you're way ahead of me? Well, I asked you for it, Crow. You were right here. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hey, how'd you get here so fast? That's what I've been trying to tell you, Mike. I'm ahead of you by about three seconds. You know what, guys? I think there may be something wrong with the space-time continuum. Servo, how'd you get my chicken puppet? Nope. Sorry. Everything's on the fritz. My burrito was done before I put it in the oven. All right, all right. Take your chicken puppet. I'll have it back before you know it anyway. <laughs> hey, Tom, why don't you just give him his chicken puppet back, all right? Say, why don't we ask Gypsy to mess with the warp engine? Well, all I know is I want my chicken puppet back. Hey, how'd that happen? That's a good idea. Gypsy, uh, there's something wrong with the space-time thingy. Isn't there anything we can do? Well, okay, Gypsy. Well, I guess all we can do is ride it out. I'm out of here. Okay, Gypsy, I guess all we can do is ride it out. I'm good. Wow, it's a weird deja vu. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's a good idea, Crow. You do that. This is really weird. We'll be right back. Well, I'm just going to play with my chicken puppet till this blows over. I'll see you, Mike. Tom. Hey, anybody see my chicken puppet? If you guys collect amiibos, especially Zelda amiibos, I have an update for you. My friend Ed gave me this. Three updates from Best Buy, Target, and GameStop. These are amiibos that he hasn't seen for a while in the stores. He's a big collector. I don't collect as many. I have a, I have several amiibos, but I'm not a, a what would you say, a, a major collector of them. Best Buy has the Guardian from Tears of the Kingdom. And it also has Wolf Link with Midna from Twilight Princess. Target, Smash Brothers Zelda, and Smash Brothers Ganondorf. And finally, GameStop has Wind Waker Zelda and Wolf Link. It's really exciting to see these amiibos back in the stores. It's possible that they've been there for you, but according to my friend Ed, this is a change. And I wonder, is Nintendo bringing out some Zelda, like reissuing them back in the stores. That's one more time. Guardian and Wolf Link at Best Buy, Smash Brothers Zelda, Smash Brothers Ganondorf at Target, and finally Wind Waker Zelda and Wolf Link at GameStop. So it's really exciting to see some older Zelda amiibos in the stores now. So guys, go check those out. Hello and konnichiwa. Tonight we present a traditional Japanese kabuki play. Translated to English, this ancient work is entitled Neil Simon's The Sunshine Boy. Now, how many of you are familiar with Japanese theater? Anyone want to? Anybody at all? Feel this one mm. or? Uh... Ah, yes, sir. And do you enjoy kabuki theater? Uh, actually, I prefer no theater. Well, then why did you raise your hand? Because I like no theater. No plays are my favorite. So you don't like any theater at all? <laughs> no, let me explain. No theater is classic Japanese drama. No plays have been produced since the 13th century, and no actors are revered, even today. <laughs> what, what, why are you dissing Japanese theater? What's your deal, man? <laughs> no, no, wait a minute. No theater started in Japan. Oh, so now you tell us Japan doesn't have any theater whatsoever. Uh, they have lots of theater, including no theater. So they have lots of theater, and they have no theater. Exactly. What? No theater. Yes. What? what? No theater. N O H. N O H, huh? Jeez. Well, there, you just gone and shown what an idiot you are. Oh, hey, I'll handle this, Tom. <laughs> Calm down. Mike, I'm going to ask you a series of simple questions which even a cretin like you could answer yes or no. Tom. Now, is there theater in Japan? Yes. Good. And do you have a particular favorite type of Japanese theater? Yes. Well, good. Now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> Mike, will you tell me the name of your favorite form of Japanese theater? No. Why not? Why not what? And why won't you tell me your favorite Japanese theater? I just did. Did what? I told you my favorite form of Japanese theater. You did? Yes. Well, will you tell me again? Yes. No. Oh, come on! Mike, I'm gonna grab a stepladder so you can jump up my butt. May we do our little kabuki play now? Yeah. Go ahead, but remember I like no theater more than I like kabuki theater. I thought you didn't like kabuki! I do! <laughs> <laughs> you gotta mess with him every now and then. We'll be right back. I get it, Mike. Dream Theater recently played the O2 Arena. This marks the beginning of their 40th anniversary tour. 
And the big news surrounding all of this, of course, is the return of Mike Portnoy, who's been gone for about 15 years. It is exciting to have Mike Portnoy back. With a little bit of sorrow, we say goodbye to the other Mike, if you will. Thank you for being part of Dream Theater all these years. I appreciate you. Your drumming was phenomenal. Your mastery of the Dream Theater songs was legendary. It's amazing that you got to take part in such a legendary band. It's such an amazing band. The best musicians in the world. So thank you, Mike, for your service. We're going to miss you, bro, and I wish you the best future. But it's so exciting to have Mike Portnoy back. The original Dream Theater back together again. The tour is starting. And I'm going down to Texas. That's right, Texas. The land of cowboy boots and country music to see Dream Theater in Houston with my good friend Joel. Dream Theater has announced their new album, Parasomnia. It seems like it's going to be a concept album where there's one theme running through all of it, which is dreams, or at least sleeping. A few years ago, I started a blog where I shared my dream journals and I talked a lot about dreams. Of course, I had to call it Theater of Dreams. Which was, seems like a ripoff of Dream Theater. <laughs> I don't care. I love Dream Theater. So you can check out my blog on my website, artera.com, if you want to check out Theater of Dreams. Parasomnia, Dream Theater's new album. They did a press release back on October 9th, and they said, We are thrilled to announce our 16th album, Parasomnia, scheduled for release on February 7th, 2025. This album marks the beginning of a special new chapter for us as bandmates and as brothers. And now you can watch the new Night Terror video. My friend Joel wrote me the other day. He said, hey, have you checked out the new Dream Theater song? I said, no. Thank you for reminding me, but I wanted to do it fresh, live, for the very first time. And I'm going to be sharing that with you guys. Parasomnia. The track list is this. The first one, In the Arms of Morpheus. That sounds pretty cool. Night Terror. That's the video that we'll be checking out together. A Broken Man, Dead Asleep, Midnight Messiah, Are We Dreaming, Bend the Clock, The Shadow Man Incident. That one rolls in at 19 minutes, 32 seconds, by the way. So awesome. They're still doing the large multi-part songs. That's really cool. Parasomnia will be available for pre-order starting October 11th, 2024, in several special configurations, including a limited deluxe box set and a limited gatefold 180G vinyl. This album represents not just our growth as musicians, but also the journey we've embarked on together over the last four decades. As we step into this new era for Dream Theater, we invite you to join us for the 40th anniversary tour, kicking off on October 20, 2024 at the O2 Arena in London, England. For more information and tickets, of course, you go to dreamtheater.net slash tour. Parasomnia. Man, that sounds cool. I'm really excited to hear this new album by Dream Theater. I'm super jazzed to be going to Houston to see them for this 40th anniversary tour. Mike Portnoy, we missed you. We're glad you're back. And, oh, dude. I know that John and John, Petrucci and Mayung, having Petrucci, Mayung, and Portnoy the original core members of Dream Theater back together again is exciting. Filling that out, of course, with Jordan Rudis. Wow. The wizard. James, sorry. I'm not... <laughs> James, brother, without your singing, without your octave climbing, insane voice, there wouldn't be the Dream Theater that we know. So thank you, James. I didn't forget you. But it is exciting to have John, John, and Mike back together again. Dream Theater, 40th anniversary tour, Parasomnia. Look for it early next year. And guys, I want to know what you think. Are you excited? What do you think of the new song? I'm actually going to do a first-time reaction video. I have not seen the new Dream Theater song. I have not seen the video. I have not heard the song. Not one note or chord. No. I have purposely stayed away because I want to share that with you. A true first-time reaction to a new song and video by my second favorite band. My favorite band that's actually living because, you know, Rush is retired. Rest in peace, Rush. So now to have Dream Theater 
brand new material from Parasomnia. It's exciting, and I want to share that with you guys. And it will be a true, legitimate first-time reaction. Honest to goodness, I have not seen it. I have not heard it. I have not heard one lick. I think I've seen the thumbnail. Stayed away. I, you know, and, and, and since I'm using the Roku on my TV, it doesn't autoplay. So it, not even that happened on my phone. So I've not seen one frame of the video. I've not heard one note of the song. We're going to do a first-time reaction, a real one. But does that bother you guys that people do first-time reactions? Do you wonder if they're actually the very first time? You guys are going to think I'm nuts for bringing this up, aren't you? Look for it soon. Night Terror, Dream Theater. You and me, first time reaction. We live in an age where rock has been all but put six feet under and killed somehow, some way, by someone. Culture has changed. This could be a six hour conversation. How culture affects music what it has done to music, meaning the popular music, and what it has done to what we call rock. That used to be the music of rebellion. Now it's not. That used to be the music that was popular. Rock used to be popular. It's not anymore. It makes you wonder why. Why is rock not popular anymore? Now it's pop music, synth pop, rap. Are there still artists that make good music? Of course. And there's still some people making rock out there. But as a genre, it has suffered dramatically. Rock has suffered dramatically. And it makes me wonder why, how, who. But within the last 20-something years, this has happened. Even up through, let's think through it. We had our quote-unquote hair bands, synth pop of the 80s, rolling into, again, just putting labels on things because it's easier, the grunge era, the post-grunge era, going into kind of a a more acoustic type set, whatever. Point is, around 2000 and moving forward, rock started to kind of fade away from it being culturally popular and accepted. Rock is now secondary to almost everything. I was like, what's happened to rock and roll? What's happened to rock? It has changed fundamentally. I think culture has changed fundamentally. Has the internet and has social media helped in this change? Probably. Maybe. It's a really good question. I don't have all the answers. It is great to see bands go out, of course, to go grab some retirement money. They hit the tour circuit and they play some concerts and they make some money off of that. Riding on nostalgia, so the older set, if you will, not the kids from teenager through the 20s, but 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, who still remember and love these rock bands from old, they're going to go see them again. But it's almost like a last hurrah, see you later, we won't see you again kind of thing. That's what it feels like. There's not this mass popularity anymore. And it makes me kind of sad. The bands that I like are not mainstream, and that makes me happy, and I'm proud of it. Rush has never been mainstream. They actually gained a lot of cultural significance and popularity in their last years, which is phenomenal, and I'm happy for them. And Neil got to see a lot of that, of course, with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He got to be part of of that generalized acceptance, if you will. But it took forever to get Rush into the Rock Hall of Fame, didn't it? It took forever. When a lot of bands who had only been around for 10 to 15 years, whatever the limit is for Hall of Fame, they were in like right away. But it took Rush an extra umpteen years to get put in. Not that that means anything to us. For those of us who love Rush, it doesn't matter 
if they're popular. It doesn't matter if Rush is accepted in mainstream culture. It doesn't matter if Rush is on the cover of Rolling Stone, or if Rush is on a talk show, or if Rush makes it into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. None of that matters, does it? It doesn't matter. What matters is that Rush means something to us. We found that we had a growing audience that didn't care about any of that press stuff, that they were into the band and they liked what we were trying to do and we were a little more thoughtful about the way we wrote music and certainly how we wrote lyrics and how we put it all together. And I'd rather read fan reviews than some guy who always hated us and didn't stay for half the show. Critically, we were designated terminally unhip and that prevents you from getting mainstream press. Our songs were too long to go on mainstream radio. The lyrics of Neil Peart mean the world to us. The music that Getty and Alex wrote, beautiful music for 40 plus years, that matters to us. We have a bond and we have a connection to Rush that is far deeper than any surface level noise that happens throughout culture. You know, all that, you're like, oh, you, here's an accolade and oh, we're going to have you on the show now. We think it'd be kind of cute. Who cares? Doesn't matter. The music and lyrics of Rush are what matters. Who they are as people is what matters. That's why Rush is important. Because of who they are, their journey, their story that we have read through the years, that we have listened to through the years. The story of Rush, this band, these men making this music, listening and learning from the words of our Professor Peart. That is what matters to us. That is all that matters to us. The rest is just noise. The rest is just culture seeing an opportunity to make a little bit of money off of a perceived new popularity of Rush, like a vampire trying to get the last drop of blood out of someone. That's what generalized media is. It, it's all fake. And it doesn't matter. Rush is what matters. Getty, Lee, Alex, Lifeson. And may you rest in peace, Neil Peart. That's what matters to us. What do you guys think? My son and I recently watched Despicable Me 4. Steve Carell, Kristen Wiig. And... It was fun. I enjoyed it. Steve Carell and his voice for Gru. I'm not even sure what that is, but it works. And it's really hilarious at times. My favorite Despicable Me movie is the first one, but I did enjoy this fourth installment. It, it's the same kind of zany adventure. It brought in new characters. But here's my big takeaway for all of these movies is... The character arc that Gru has gone on and remains on, going from a criminal in the first movie, kind of a super villain type, to when he finds these three young girls. And these three young girls stay with him. He ends up, of course, through the series now, up to the fourth installment, he adopts these girls. He gets married. And then he starts working for an anti-crime unit. Now his job is to actually take out and capture people who are committing crimes, other supervillains. So he's using his, his know-how of being kind of a supervillain spy kind of guy to now actually fight bad and fight evil. But it's him as a dad, adoring these young little girls, taking care of them, protecting them at all costs. Not to give away too many spoilers, but the family's life is in jeopardy. Of course, he is these three girls, adopted girls, but he now has his own baby, okay, because he's married to the character of Kristen Wiig, who's Lucy. So Gru and Lucy are married, and they have their own baby, so a little boy. So now there's three girls, a little boy, and the family's life is in danger. First priority to get them to safety, and he does. He brings them to a safe house. He sacrifices his own comfort and, and his own standing in the community to protect his family. He's a great father, and I love that. 
And I've seen that uh, several times recently. And if you look back on some of my reviews, we saw it so beautifully in the If movie. Again, Steve Carell playing Blue in that movie. But now he is the father in this movie. And it's so lovely, though, to see a strong and a confident, sometimes bumbling for comedic effect, but he's still a good dad who is respected and loved by his wife. And there's a great arc in this movie about his baby. You got to watch it. Despicable Me 4. It is a good family film. And I do recommend it. Because, and you know, you can keep counting. The, the amount of sequels that we get these days is ridiculous, isn't it? They keep going and going. However, if you can still come up with funny and smart, well-told stories, why not keep making them? Why not still developing the characters, the world, the lore, the background, and then seeing past villains and past characters come back into this movie, as we've seen with other sequels that are done well. It is so great to see, though, the story continue, and the fact that he remains true to the man that he became. Again, going from bad to good, going from a loner to a father, and now a father of four who's married, and they have a pet goat, and it's just, I, I love that. You know, you, I've talked a lot about this, that proper portrayal of men is something that's really important to me, and I think that we should hold it up as an example, and hold it up as something that should be done, and be done well. So again, Despicable Me for Steve Carell, Kristen Wiig. Check it out, guys. And of course, I haven't even mentioned it yet. The Minions. We are looking for the strong, the mighty, oh, no. the fearless. Uh, nope. We need the best of the best. <laughs> the Minions are there. They're up to all their same hijinks. There's a whole new set of like primary Minions that we get to know. And if you've seen the trailer, then you've kind of got a hint at what they go through. Despicable Me 4, great family film. I recommend it, guys. Yeah! Everyday Glory on Counterparts. In the house where nobody laughs and nobody sleeps. In the house where love lies dying and the shadows creep. A little girl hides shaking with her hands on her ears, pushing back the tears till the pain disappears. Man, that paints a, a sad reality for that little girl, doesn't it? Let's see why. Mama says some ugly words. Daddy pounds the wall. They can fight about their little girl later, but right now they don't care at all, no matter what they say. Mama says some ugly words. Daddy pounds the wall. I've been there. I've repented for it, but I've been there. I've pounded a few doors and a few walls. Sometimes as men, that's the only way we can vent our frustrations. It's not healthy, and I don't do it anymore, but I've been there. I wonder if you have too. Everyday people, everyday shame. Everyday promise, shot down in flames. Everyday sunrise, another everyday story, rise from the ashes, a blaze of everyday glory. I love that he's talking about every day. Because each day we do have a new opportunity to do things better. And to be better people than we were the day before. That's just one take on that. An everyday glory. When you can not pound the wall that next day. When you can not say ugly words. And be kind and compassionate instead. When you can be peaceful instead of punching something. That is a glorious thing. That is something you can do the next day. That is how we can grow and be better as people. In the city where nobody smiles and nobody dreams. In the city where desperation drives the board to extremes. But just one spark of decency against the starless night. One glow of hope and dignity. A child can follow the light. 
Just one spark of decency against the starless night. One glow of hope and dignity. A child can follow the light. Ooh, that's some... so true. The children are watching. Your kids are watching. They're watching you for an example. But just one spark of decency. One glow of hope and dignity. A child can follow that light. They can follow you and, and, and try to be like you. So our kids are watching. Keep that in mind. Your kids are always watching. Be the very best example you can be for them. If the future's looking dark, we're the ones who have to shine. If there's no one in control, we're the ones who have to draw the line. And though we live in trying times, we're the ones who have to try. And though we know that time has wings, we're the ones who have to fly. If the future's looking dark, we're the ones who have to shine. We can't control the feelings of others. We can't control the direction in which this world takes and what's allowed and what's not and the darkness that surrounds us. But what can we do in the midst of that? We can shine. We can be the very best people we can be. We can be the best fathers. We can be the best mothers, brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, friends, co-workers we can be the very best and though the future is looking dark we're the ones who have to shine and what happens when we do that okay if we're all surrounded by darkness and we're the ones trying to shine what happens and when if i'm in a completely dark room and i light a match what happens that's light now what if 20 of us lit a match we now light up that room, don't we? And we light 10 different candles. Okay, so now there's all these points of light. And all of a sudden, we're not in darkness anymore, are we? We're surrounded by light. That's what it is to shine. And that's what we can do. We're the ones who have to shine. We're the ones who have to set an example. We're the ones who have to be the very best people we can be. Good, decent, kind, generous, serving people the best people we can be. We're the ones who have to shine. Don't wait for someone else to do it. We're the ones. We can do that. If there's no one in control, we're the ones who draw the line. Sometimes it makes you wonder who's in control. This darkness that he speaks of, goes hand in hand with chaos. Darkness, evil, things that are bad, things that are out to get us, things that are out to destroy us, they feed on chaos. They want us to feel endangered. They want us to fear. They want us to be fearful all the time. And we have to draw the line we have to shine, let our light shine in the darkness, and draw a line in the sand and say, no, 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 no. It won't be that way. The way things ought to be, no, it's going to be like this. I don't think so. We're the ones who draw that line. No. So don't be afraid. Be bold. Be brave. Be the best person you can be. Draw that line in the sand and say, no, you're not crossing this line. I'm not going to let you cross this line because I'm not going to cross that line. I am going to be the best person I can be. This is the line in which I will come up to, but I will not go beyond it. Though we live in trying times, we're the ones who have to try. We do live in trying times, and yet that's nothing new. Humanity has always dealt with trying times. Through the course of history, through the course of the earliest empires on earth, to the modern governments and world leaders of today, mankind goes through trying times. This world is 
often dark. This world is often challenging. This world is often chaotic. And yet, if we try and keep trying and every day trying to achieve a, a level of glory, to achieve a level of being the best people we can be, we're the ones who have to try. It's on us. We can't wait for anyone else. We can do this together. We're the ones who have to try. Though we know that time has wings, we're the ones who have to fly. It's so beautiful. And it's such a beautiful part of the song, too, the way Getty sings that lyric. Time does have wings. It was proven so poignantly these past few days as I've wanted to come in here and talk to you guys. And yet life got in the way and all the things got in the way. Family and responsibilities and work got in the way. Time just flew by and time flew by and time flew by. Time does fly. Time does have wings. And often it seems like it's just out of reach, right? It's almost like ahead of us. Though we're trapped in this temporal existence, it feels like we're chasing time sometimes, doesn't it? We're the ones who have to fly. And, you know, that's poetic language that you and I can each interpret the way that we want to interpret it. But I see optimism there. I want to see optimism there. And I have a feeling Neil meant it to be optimistic that... Though we live in these trying times, and time is just flying by, it has wings, we have to try and we have to fly. To soar to new heights. To each day, every day, find glory in doing a little bit better each day. And being better people each day. And I hope we can all do that. If you have other thoughts about the song... You know I'd love to hear them, and I'll probably talk about them next time. So that's Everyday Glory, Wisdom of Neil Peart, and the Majesty of the Music and Lyrics of Rush. It's good stuff. Is this yours? No, I think it's good. Yeah. Hello. Uh, hello. Hello. I'm Droppy the Water Droplet, here to talk to you about water, nature's liquid. Okay, why? Well, in today's motion picture, much was made of the propensity of dinosaurs to gather near water. I remember one And line. yet, sadly, water was not featured. Uh, that's true, And but, so uh... I have been hired by the Water Council to dispel some of the myths being propagated, probably by jealous solids and semi-solids, about this tremendously versatile fluid. Oh, well, now where the hell did he go? Hello, I'm Droppy, the Water Droplet. Yes, you are. Did you know that there are literally tens of thousands of uses for water? Here are just a few thousand. Moisten your hair with me and apply a commercial grade detergent. Lather, rinse, and repeat for a cleaner smelling head. A crow, I think we're all familiar Send with Send me them. through your lower atmosphere, freezing me into multifaceted crystalline patterns. Children enjoy my easy shape ability. Store me in huge glass lined tanks and allow grains and yeast to ferment in me. Then just filter, age, and bottle me for a treat that dads can't resist. Are these in any kind of order? Sir, we got a lot of these to go through, so if you could please hold your water. <laughs> the, the water council fed me that one. <laughs> anyway, use me in your cellular structure as an affordable building block of life itself. Store me frozen on your inefficient roofs, allowing portions of me to melt and refreeze on your eaves in beautiful conical shapes. You know what? We'll uh, tell you what you missed Use after me to this, flush okay? toxins from your body and store me in your bladder. Okay, yeah, that's, that's about enough. What, what? Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I watched it. It's been many years since I've seen the original Beetlejuice movie. Of course, Michael Keaton, Winona Ryder, Catherine O'Hara, and now Jenna Ortega. But also along the ride is Justin Thoreau, William Dafoe, Monica Bellucci. Really great cast. Here's the thing, though. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. How about I just call it Beetlejuice 2? Beetlejuice 2 suffered from pacing. It had some really funny moments. Beetlejuice was who he always is. Over the top. Insane. Some kind of demon ghost that lives in the underworld. But the thing is, the story 
had to set up multiple storylines and subplots. And as it did that, it, it's to be kind, we'll call it a slow burn. But Beetlejuice 2 suffered, though, from the pacing. And my son told me, and he fell asleep during it, and he told me he fell asleep because it was boring. I recognized multiple subplots and threads that they were weaving throughout the movie, and I was along for the ride enough to allow them to come to fruition. As it suffered from pacing, they really introduced almost too many threads, too many subplots to the movie. And while they do get paid off in the end, by that time it feels a little anticlimactic, where in one location, at the end of the movie, they then have to start Xing off one story, one villain at a time, and it seems like they just had a checklist. Let's, all right, we took care of that guy. That guy's taken care of. Great. And then, all right, we got to take care of this one. Oh, we got to make sure we get to the big musical number, which they do a version of MacArthur Park. And as a kind of a dream sequence, at Beetlejuice, you know, he can make people do things. And when he has power in the real world, you didn't get the payoff that the slow burn deserved. The cast was phenomenal. They did their very best and did it well with the writing that they had. Jenna Ortega, as usual, phenomenal. Some of the funny moment, funniest moments are with Jenna Ortega. And she is now the daughter of uh, Lydia Dietz, you know, Winona Ryder's character, and she plays Astrid Dietz. Phenomenal. She's great. Winona Ryder, she, she does her job. It does it well. Catherine O'Hara, over the top. Zany, crazy as ever. Really great. Monica Bellucci uh, was good as well. I mean, so everyone did their job well and did the best they could with the script that they were given. And yeah, this movie suffered from too many subplots, taking too long to get to them, and then having kind of a forced... And here's the thing. Once we kind of tied everything off, we finally took care of all the villains, we put everyone in their place, and we'd, we'd taken care of everything. Once all these things were taken care of, there was a repeat of a joke that was done earlier. And that felt forced. It was comedic. It was over the top. The effects were phenomenal and real. I'm really blown away, as usual, with what Tim Burton brought to us, which were, it was not a CGI fest. He actually used stop motion. Oh, and beautiful stop motion. And it gives this very real look to it. But at the same time, since it's stop motion, it also feels otherworldly. Like it's out of place. It adds kind of to a creepy factor to it. But I, I do love it. I'd rather watch stop motion for this kind of effect than some kind of CGI thing. The artistry and the craftsmanship that went into the stop motion characters. There's a plane sequence that's completely puppets, completely stop motion. And at first you think it's CGI, but it's not. No, it's all real. It's all shot in camera through the lens. It's real. And it's beautifully done. And I told my son, my son loves working with puppets. My son is very creative. And I said, that could be you. Keep doing what you're doing. And, and he actually, he wants to go make stop motion stuff now. And I, I've given him kind of a crash course in how to do it and, and how to shoot it and how we can edit it together. So we're, he's probably going to do that. And I'm excited for him. And I said, there's still jobs out there for you. In this industry, for true artistry and craftsmanship, actually shooting stuff through a lens with a camera at real objects that you're taking painstaking time to manipulate over time, right? Stop motion, where you move it, shoot it, move it, shoot it, move it, shoot it. And what you do is each movement of this object, whatever it might be, then appears to motion over time as each frame goes by. Forgive me for over-explaining stop motion, but that added a beautiful real element to this. And had it gone CGI instead of, which would have been a complete sea change from the first movie, it would have suffered for it. So I'm proud of Tim Burton for that. If you're a fan of Beetlejuice, 
watch it. Why not? Your lips are slender, your eyes are blue, your hair is blonde, your lips the way they're red, your skin, your fingers, your ears, your nose, your touch, your feet. I am sad. Oh, um, Mike, the water there, um, it got into a fuse box. Uh, there's a small fire. Uh, that's okay, we'll get it. Oh, I need you so much, I fall down and cry. You Mike, uh, look. Uh, I'll wait. You're like wine. Uh, Mike, the fire's a little worse than we thought. It must have gotten into some insulation or something. Oh, oh boy. I woo many ladies. They are fair ladies all. Look, Mike, what we need you to do is to move out of that part of the ship. Raindrops and snowflakes and puppies. Mike, would you forget oh, about the raindrops and the puppies and get out? Life support is failing. Decks three through seven are gone. Trouble I look out! Ah! Eyes, they're like wine. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah, Mike, uh, we got it. <coughs> so There's still a lot of smoke and water down here, but as far as we know, it's out. Uh, like look, we're gonna go make some nachos, okay? Nachos? Whoa, be right there! The other night, my son wanted to have a nacho bel grande, but he wanted to make it at home, and I thought that was really cool. So my wife helped him cook the beef and put in the seasoning and get the cheese and get the nachos ready and, and all the different things that make up a nacho bel grande. And they did that. Here's the thing. My son didn't eat it all. So what I did was I pulled out the, the now soggy chips, and I had this beef mixture. It's actually beef and pork. We're going to start getting that for now on. A beef-pork mixture instead of just beef for ground beef. And it, it was nicely seasoned. I added some salsa to it. But then I got this. In the frozen aisle, TJI Fridays has a spinach and artichoke dip. A cheese dip. So when you mix that together with a nice kind of semi-spicy cheese, it's a beautiful cheese dip for nachos. So using my son's concoction, the beef... I add some salsa to it. I then dipped it in the cheese and dipped it in the beef and I had my own Nacho Bel Grande. I want to make this for you guys. You won't have to go to Taco Bell again. We can make our own Nachos Bel Grande at home and guess what? It's a lot better. It's an amazing set of nachos. I have a couple other things that I want to do as well. But yeah, more cooking videos are coming. I know I've said that a couple times now for a couple weeks. But guess what, guys? Uh, it's going to happen real soon. And then beyond that, a proper meal. I'm not sure what yet. And that's the story. This is Gary Kanan from our new center in Albuquerque. <laughs> Gary's a great guy. I didn't schedule a meteor shower as part of the evening entertainment at the reservation. But it should be quite a sight. And this is a great meal, Professor. That's a great stew. Mm. What's in it? Oh, a lot of things. Rattlesnake, Velveeta. Chicken, corn, green peppers, mm. chili, onions, uh, hair. Well, it's an old recipe around here. In college, I had a band. It was called Goat Meal. I said Goat Meal with a G. My friend Joel, my friend Will, and we got a drummer. I was lead singer, and I played saxophone on a couple songs. I also, when we did a cover of Message in a Bottle, I was able to do a sax solo at the end and play my saxophone to do a solo. But other than that, I was a singer. And it was a lifelong dream fulfilled when we played Stick It Out from Counterparts. Counterparts was the new album at the time when our band was together and we did a cover of Stick It Out, to get to sing a Rush song was a dream come true. And I want desperately to find the video of that, of us performing it. I think somewhere on a videotape, I have Goatmeal playing Stick It Out and possibly Message in a Bottle. 
But for now, settle for these photos. But yeah, Goat Meal, stick it out. It was such an honor to play Rush. It's one thing to cover a song. It's another thing to get to cover a Rush song. And to have my best friend Joel be playing Alex's part. And my friend Will be playing Getty's part. And I'm singing Neil's lyrics. Getty's position as lead singer. And our drummer, he kept up pretty well. He learned the song and I was proud of him for learning a Rush song. But yeah, man, to, to play Stick It Out was amazing. And I miss Goat Meal. My friend Joel and I recently, we were texting back and forth. I think we were talking about the upcoming Dream Theater tour and how we're going to go see them in Houston, 40th anniversary tour. And we Goat Meal came up. We wondered where Will is. We don't know where Will is. We know he was studying to be a doctor. We since after college lost track of Will. So Will, if you're out there, contact us. I won't say your last name, try to keep some anonymity here, but pictures of you, I'm, I'm gonna be showing them. Will, if you're out there, contact Joel and I, contact me. We'd love to do a, a reunion of Goat Meal, whether it be virtual or in person. One thing I haven't brought up yet is that we made Goat Meal the movie. Yeah, back then on MTV, a lot of you may recall, Rockumentaries were a big thing. A documentary about rock. A rockumentary. And on that, you know, they would feature whatever popular band or different bands. And they would tell their story and, and how they went through trials and they overcame them and went through different losses. You know, a documentary. Well, we made Goat Meal the movie. And we shot a bunch of material. We shot us playing. We came up with a couple different narrative threads to go through our Goat Meal the movie. Anyway, that's another videotape I need to find. It's Goat Meal the Movie. I'd love to share it with you guys. But man, it was an honor playing Rush, making Goat Meal the Movie, but also we'd love to do a Goat Meal reunion tour. Well, not a tour. <laughs> I can't believe I just said tour. <laughs> yes, at an arena near you, Goat Meal, a band no one's ever heard of with zero albums. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 we're going to do a tour, all right. But anyway, yeah, a Goat Meal reunion. That would be great, because I would, of course, record it all and share it with you guys. And that way you, you can experience the magic and the majesty of Goat Meal. Man, I miss us. And our first name, by the way, it wasn't always Goat Meal. One of the trial run names was Russian Space Monkeys. And Joel and I have a whole thread of jokes about this, uh, where he called me Crazy Ivan. And what was the other name? Oh, Joel, forgive me. I'm forgetting the other name. We had a couple of different Russian nicknames for ourselves, much like Rush does between them, like Lurkst and the Professor or whatever it might be. One night we were in Will's room. We're hanging out in his dorm room, probably planning our goat meal taking over the world thing. And, and Will's like, how about goat meal? We're like, what? Yeah, goat meal. You know, oatmeal with, and then the rest is history. And like, that, that's too precious. We've always wanted to make, though, a goat meal sequel. A sequel movie. So yes, we have to find Will. And this time we're going to play a lot more Rush. Goat meal, playing Rush. And this time it's all going to be shared with you guys on YouTube. Man, I really hope we can make that happen. <laughs> it's it, it's crazy the, the antics you get up to in college two of the wisest men I've ever known not personally, not in person but I've known them through their work one through his lyrics and books and blog the other through a radio show and his books both use similar themes to describe life and describe a certain part of our lives, which is accepting the reality that we live in, the way things are, and the way things we wish they would be, the way things ought to be. A lot of times they are so opposed from each other. The reality that we live in and how we want them to be. 
the reality that we live in and how it really should be. A lot of times they're so opposed, aren't they? And that's just because the world is broken. The world can be really dark, confusing, painful, challenging. And because of that, we often have this, this duality of, man, things are this way. I wish they were that way. Things are this way. It should be that way. You ever felt that before? Have you ever felt that things should be different? The way things are are not the way they ought to be? These are very similar things. Neil Peart, how it is, how it ought to be. Rush Limbaugh, the way things ought to be. Because of this, I started thinking about the difference between what I really enjoy and what I'm expecting and what I think would be great for whatever it might be, whether it be gaming or what we watch or what we listen to. For example, the Switch 2. We don't know a lot of details yet. There have been some leaks about the hardware and what it can and might do. The way things that I feel ought to be is I want the Switch 2 to be completely congruent with and in line with the specs of, to the best of their variability, we know the Switch 2 was going to be portable, so we cannot completely emulate the PS5 and the Xbox One, their graphic capabilities. However, if there's enough parity there to where it can run high res, and I want the Switch 2 to be 4K, running at 60 frames a second, but if it can output 4K 60 frames a second to a monitor, to a TV, that's how I feel things ought to be. The next Zelda game. Would do you guys like Echoes of Wisdom? Let me know. If you've played Echoes of Wisdom, do you like it? Do you like playing as Zelda? Do you like playing in this kind of animated cartoon world, right? That's not photorealistic. That's not like Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. Do you like Echoes of Wisdom so far? Are you guys enjoying it? I'm not a big fan of Zelda games that are not full, as, as full resolution as it can be, open world, following Link, with, with being able to move the camera, in 360 degrees, that's how I like my Zelda games. That's how I feel they ought to be. And this this kind of quarter view, if you will, this the way it is, how it is, and how Echoes of Wisdom is. Not my. I've I've said this over and over in many different episodes, in many different videos, in a couple of different podcasts. It is not my favorite type of Zelda. I really most enjoy Zelda in a full 3D world, like Breath of the Wild, like Tears of the Kingdom, like Ocarina of Time, or even Twilight Princess, Skyward Sword. All of these games, these are my favorite Zelda games for that very reason. Because I am using... Link is my avatar to where I can explore the complete kingdom and the complete land and different worlds in different places. I really want the next Zelda game to return to that. So I'm wondering, do you guys like Echoes of Wisdom? Do you want us to return to a full 3D open world engine that we had in the previous Zelda games with Link as a protagonist? Are you with me on that? Because that, that's what I want. That's how I feel they ought to be. That's what I want from the next Zelda game is I want us to return to that. And Echoes of Wisdom is a complete departure and it feels like a one-off and I just want to know are you guys liking it, and are you enjoying it? I used to be more of a movie snob in that during my college years, as I was learning production, and I was learning how movies were made so I could make them myself, and learning about film and video, and, and all the different things from editing to shooting and stuff like that, and even I've written multiple screenplays. Along those lines, I, I became... More looking for art house, looking for film festival type films. However, what I really enjoy is a fun movie. Whether it be Mission Impossible or John Wick 
or maybe a really good animated movie, something that's action, something that's fun, a quote-unquote pop- popcorn movie, the Avenger movies, and the, the good ones, uh, the Spider-Man movies, the really good Batman movies, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, I could go on and on. Now that I've seen the extended editions, I can't go back to the theatrical versions. The four-hour versions are near perfection in their pacing and the storytelling and the action and the drama and, and the characters and just how the films are made and, and how it, it, the experience that I get, the escape with it within the world of Middle Earth that I get with Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson's trilogy, that's movie perfection to me. That's what I feel with the original Star Wars trilogy and a lot of the Avenger movies and a bunch of the Spider-Man movies and the Batman movies. That's what I get from them is the ability to escape, have a load of fun, see some stuff blow up, see my heroes overcome evil and be victorious. That's what I want for movies. I don't really care about the artsy fartsy stuff where there's just drama in, in a kitchen and people are in pain all the time. I live with enough pain as it is. When I watch a movie, I want to escape. I want to escape the daily grind that I'm going through. I want to get away from all the crap I have to go through. I want to escape within that world and enjoy myself. And live vicariously through these characters. As they go through a well-told story. And as they overcome whatever obstacle whatever villain and whatever evil thing they might have to get out of their way so they can be victorious. So they can be the winners of their story. That's what I want from movies. I could care less about things that represent real life. Could care less. And the same goes for TV. I want to completely escape reality. I've had enough reality. Reality is a daily grind for me. And man, I don't mean to be a bummer here, but I can't be the only one where a day-to-day, hour-to-hour is a challenge. And yet we rise above, we do our best to be the best people, to serve others to the best of our ability, to love and serve our neighbors, to work at our jobs, to help out our families. And that, that is an honor and a privilege, right? But it's hard. Isn't it hard? Life isn't easy, is it? Why do I bring up these kind of depressing things? Because I want to show you that that's life. Life isn't easy. And if you think it is, then you haven't been through it yet. And unfortunately, you you will. But those of you who are with me, and those of you who are challenged... And do go through challenges. I think you feel me. And you know that life is hard. But we get up every day. And we're thankful for that new day. And we keep going. So. When I want to spend some time. Away from this world. I want to escape. And I go into Middle Earth. Or I go into the world of Star Wars. Or I go to Doctor Who and travel in the TARDIS. Or I go with Avengers and I become Iron Man for a while. Or Spider-Man. Or I go over and I'm Superman or Batman. And whatever fantasy or sci-fi it might be. Or I'm time traveling with 12 monkeys. Or I'm with Michael J. Fox and we're getting in DeLorean. And we're going back to 1984. And we're meeting our mom and dad. And making sure they get together so we can exist. You see what I mean? I want to escape. I want to go on a wild ride of fantasy and sci-fi that is nothing like my real life. There are elements, yes. Things need to be grounded. But it is about that escape. Because I believe escapism is important. Escaping our daily grind is the pleasure of movies is the pleasure of a well thought out and well executed TV series is the pleasure of fantastic music that makes us think escape and go somewhere else besides the monotony and grind of our daily routines. You feel me on that? 
Do any of you guys understand? That's what I've grown to want and need from movies. And this is all part of a greater coping mechanism. I spent a lot of years wallowing in anger, frustration, depression, anxiety. I was pretty messed up for a while, dealing with the health issues that I deal with every day. Part of getting by that, part of dealing with stress, part of coping, a healthy coping, with the daily grind that I go through, is the right type of entertainment I watch. Something that allows me to escape, but also something that is positive, where good overcomes bad, where the good guy overcomes evil. I want to know what you guys think. Thank you guys so much. Leave me a comment below and like it if you like it. Subscribe if you want to see more videos like this in the future. I hope you have a really good night.